Chapter 12 Dr. No Bond and the girl were sitting in a large, pleasant bedroom in Dr. No's headquarters. The building was deep inside the mountain at the west end of the island. Bond and Honey were prisoners. The bedroom had no windows, and there were no handles on the doors, but Bond and Honey had been treated well. They hadn't met the mysterious Dr. No yet. When they'd first arrived, early in the morning, a Chinese woman had looked after Honey and Bond. She'd given them clean kimonos, long, loose Japanese robes. She'd spoken to them kindly. She told Bond and Honey to give her their wet, dirty clothes so that they could be washed. Then Bond and the girl had been locked in the bedroom and left alone to sleep. The prisoners found a delicious breakfast waiting for them when they woke. After they had eaten the meal, the kind woman had come to the room. She had told them that they would meet Dr. No that evening, and that they'd have dinner with him. She asked what kind of food they preferred. When she'd left them alone again, Bond started to think carefully. He'd soon decided that Dr. No must be doing something more important on Crab Key than collecting guano. The inside of the headquarters was cool and pleasant. The furniture was comfortable and expensive, but the building was as strong as a prison. Perhaps I'll find out this evening what the doctor's real business is, Bond thought. He looked at the girl. He felt angry with himself. They were in danger, and he'd led her here. Honey, Bond said to the girl, please don't say much when we meet Dr. No. If he asks questions, let me answer them. Then agree with anything that I say. I'll tell him that we're only interested in birds and seashells. I want him to believe that. If he believes that story, perhaps we'll be able to leave this island alive. At nine o'clock in the evening, the Chinese woman took Bond and Honey to a large room which was further down inside the mountain. At the end of the room, there was a huge window that went from the floor to the ceiling. It was the only window in the room, and it was made of thick, strong glass. But Bond and Honey couldn't see the land and sky through the glass. They could see rocks and hundreds of fish. Large sharks and barracudas swam slowly past the window. An octopus was stuck to the glass. Dr. No's headquarters were built below the surface of the sea. In the center of the room there was a large table. It was prepared for a fine meal, with plates, knives, forks, spoons, and sparkling wine glasses on it. Dr. No will join you very soon, the woman told them. Then she left the room, locking the door behind her. A moment later, another door opened, and a very strange man walked slowly into the room. The man was very tall, at least six inches taller than Bond, and he was very thin. But he was also completely bald. There was no hair at all on his round head. The skin of his face was smooth, and his lips were thin and pressed together in a cruel smile. The man was wearing a long, silver-gray kimono which reached to the ground. But two things about the man especially shocked and surprised Bond. The first thing was that the man had no hands. Instead of hands, he had large metal claws at the ends of his arms. And the second thing was that he had strange black eyes. I am Dr. Julius No, the man said. I can't shake your hands. As you can see, I have no hands. But please, don't be frightened of the way I look. And please, don't think that I'm blind. These see everything. As he said the last words, he touched his eyes with his steel claws. Bond and Honey heard little tapping sounds. They were like the sounds of someone's fingernail tapping a wine glass. We're not frightened, Dr. No, Bond said after a moment's silence. Perhaps you're trying to frighten us. There are lots of men with steel hands. 
Some of them are brave men who were injured in the war. And many people don't wear spectacles. They wear contact lenses in their eyes instead of glasses. Your contact lenses are unusually dark, but they aren't frightening. I'm not frightened, because you're really just a man like me. Well, I'm not really like you, Mr. James Bond of the British Secret Intelligence Service, Dr. No answered. I have great power, and at the moment you have none. But I want to talk to you about other things now. We have many things to say to one another. Any man who has a gun has power over a man without one, Bond said quietly. But only countries and governments have real power. Dr. No, if you hurt or kill me, my country will make you pay for it. At that moment one of the doors opened and two Chinese servants entered the room. The men carried plates of food and bottles of wine which they put on the table. One of the servants poured wine into the wine glasses by Bond and Honey's plates. After that, both men stood against the wall behind the prisoner's chairs. The men looked strong and powerful. Before we begin our conversation, I must tell you this, Dr. No continued. I don't want to hear any lies, Mr. Bond. I know a lot about you and why you are here. Do you understand? Bond looked at the tall, thin man. Yes, doctor, Bond said. But before you tell me anything, please, let the girl go. She isn't a danger to you. She didn't come here with me. She doesn't work for my government. She's Jamaican. I found her on the island yesterday. She came in her own boat to collect seashells. Then she's very unlucky, said Dr. No. Nobody who visits this island without my permission ever leaves it alive. No one can interfere with my work here. Strangways and his assistant tried to interfere, so I had them killed. The girl will stay and listen to us talk, Mr. Bond, Dr. No said in a cold voice. Then both of you will die. But first, please, eat your food. You'll both need to be strong for the ordeals that are waiting for you. And while we eat, I'll tell you my story. Well, my dear, we have no choice, Bond said to Honey. We must listen to this madman. Perhaps you are right, Mr. Bond, Dr. No said. He spoke calmly and softly. Perhaps I am mad. But all great men are mad. And I'm certainly a great man. So Bond and Honey tried to eat while Dr. No told them about his life. My father was a German man who lived in China, and my mother was a Chinese woman from a good family, he began. But my mother and father were not married. After I was born, I lived with my aunt, but she didn't love me. I left her house as soon as I could, and I went to work in the city of Shanghai. I worked for gangs of criminals, tongs. I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed hurting people and killing people. After a few years, I went to live in America, in New York, Dr. No went on. I worked for the Chinese gangs there. One day, I stole some money from the Hip Sing gang. I stole one million dollars. I should have left America then, but I didn't. For the only time in my life I was stupid. I tried to hide from the Hip Sing gang. But they found me and tortured me. They hurt me very much. They tried to make me tell them where the money was. My ordeal was terrible. But I didn't tell them what they wanted to know. So they cut off my hands and let me go. While Dr. No was speaking, Bond was thinking carefully. How could he escape? And where could he get a weapon? The knife that he'd been given to eat his meat with was very sharp. It would be a useful weapon if he could hide it. He had an idea. He moved his arm suddenly and knocked over his wine glass. Then, while he was cleaning up the liquid, he carefully pushed the sharp knife into the sleeve of his kimono. 
Dr. No didn't see what Bond was doing. He was only interested in telling his own story, and the servant who took away Bond's plate and brought him a dish of fruit didn't see that a knife was missing. I moved to the west coast of the United States, Dr. No was saying. I used the million dollars very well. I paid a doctor to change the shape of my face. I had these contact lenses made for my eyes. I had all my hair removed. I started to wear special shoes, which made me look much taller. I changed my name. Then I went to a college and studied medicine. I knew that I wouldn't be able to work as a doctor, because doctors need real hands. But for many years I studied people's bodies and minds. Those subjects interest me the most. But of course, I had to earn some more money. When my medical studies were finished, I bought this island, the doctor said. I brought some workers here, and I started to collect and sell the guano. I've lived here for fourteen years. I'm proud of what I have done, Mr. Bond. I was tortured by the tongs, but I lived after that terrible ordeal. And now I'm a very rich and a very successful businessman. That's why I'm a great man, Mr. Bond. Well, I'm sure that you are a very clever man, Dr. No, Bond replied. But I don't believe that you live here just to collect guano for fertilizer. You live here for another reason. You're working for somebody else. I'm sure about that. You're a clever man, too, Dr. No said. And of course, you're correct. I am here for another reason. You're a British spy, Mr. Bond. You must know about an island called Turks Island. It's about three hundred miles from here. It's where the Americans fire their new weapons and study how they work. Who do you think might be interested in that place? The Soviet Union, Bond replied. And once again you are correct, said Dr. No. My headquarters here on Crab Key has the most modern spying equipment. With this equipment I can spy on Turks Island. I can listen to radio transmissions. I'll find out information about the American weapons. And the Soviet government is going to pay me an enormous amount of money for that information. Chapter 13 Endurance. Dr. No stopped speaking and looked at Bond and Honey for a few moments. When he spoke again, his voice was almost sad. I can tell you everything tonight, because neither of you will be alive to tell anyone else about it tomorrow, he said. They'd finished eating their fruit now. One of Dr. No's servants took away the wine glasses and the empty plates. The other servant put a box of cigarettes and a gold cigarette lighter next to Bond. "'Please, smoke a cigarette if you want to, Mr. Bond,' said Dr. No. "'You have a few more minutes to enjoy yourself.' Bond lit a cigarette and waited until the Chinese servant was standing by the wall again. Then Bond carefully pushed the cigarette lighter into the sleeve of his kimono. He now had two weapons. Well, I think that we've said all that there is to say, Dr. No said. When you've finished your cigarette, Mr. Bond, your ordeal will begin. The girl's ordeal will be different from yours. Dr. No looked at Honey for a few minutes. Then he continued speaking. Now his voice was soft and cool. You will feel more pain than you've ever felt before, he said. I'm interested in pain, and I'm interested in how men and women can endure pain. Endurance is a very interesting subject, Dr. No went on, in a quieter voice. Sometimes I make experiments on people like you two, people who come here without my permission. You two have made a lot of trouble for me, so I'll give you a lot of pain. But please, remember this. You'll die, yes, but your deaths will be useful. 
Your deaths will increase our knowledge about people's bodies. One day, I'll give the results of my experiments to the scientists of the world. My experiments will make me famous. Dr. No pointed at Honey. You'll die in an unusual way, he told her. I've only made this experiment once before. I experimented on a woman who worked for me on the island. That woman endured pain for three hours before she died. Bond was listening to what Dr. No was saying to Honey, but he was also thinking about how to save her. This island is called Crab Key because many thousands of crabs live here, Dr. No told the girl. You're a Jamaican, so you must know about these crabs. They're as big as plates, and they have black bodies. At this time of year, the crabs come from their homes by the seashore, and they climb up towards the mountain. They eat anything that they find in their paths. One of their paths to the mountain is very close to this building, Dr. No continued, and tonight, as the crabs walk along their path, they'll find a young woman. She'll be tied to the ground. That woman will be you, Miss Ryder. The crabs will touch your body with their claws. They'll eat you slowly. It'll be a horrible death. How many hours will pass before you die? Can you guess? The girl cried out. Then she closed her eyes and her head fell forward. She didn't move or speak. She had fainted. A moment later, Dr. No spoke some words in Chinese to the servant who stood behind Honey's chair. The man moved forward, picked up the unconscious girl easily, and put her over his shoulder. Then he walked towards the door. The door opened, and he left the room. At the same time, the other servant walked up behind Bond, grabbed Bond's arms, and pressed them tightly to his sides. The servant's hands were huge and strong. For half a minute, there was silence. Bond was thinking as quickly as he could. He was thinking about the sharp knife and the cigarette lighter which were hidden in his sleeve. How could he use these things? If he could get near Dr. No, then he'd have a chance to kill the madman. But the servant was still holding Bond's arms to his sides. He couldn't move. Dr. No spoke again. Mr. Bond, the doctor said, do you still believe that only countries and governments have real power? Perhaps you've changed your mind now. I can decide how the girl will die. And I can decide how you will die. So I'll tell you now about your own death. That is real power. I'm interested in what people's bodies can endure, Dr. No continued, but I'm also interested in the endurance of people's minds. For example, how does a person's mind endure terror? The worker who I left out for the crabs didn't die from the injuries that the crabs made on her body. She died of terror. But I want to find out how long a human body can endure pain before it loses all its strength. So I've made a new experiment. I've made a kind of obstacle course. And you, Mr. Bond, will now be the subject for my experiment. Your body and your mind will be tested. Some of my obstacles are physical. You'll have to endure pain and injuries to your body. Other obstacles are mental. You'll have to endure fear and doubt in your mind. You've slept well and eaten good food, Dr. No went on. Your body is strong and fit. Now I want to see how long you can endure my obstacle course. I want to know how many obstacles you'll overcome before you die, Mr. Bond. You won't complete the course. You will die before the end. There'll finally be one obstacle that you can't overcome. Which will it be? Yes, I ask myself that. Which will it be? And after your death, Dr. No said with a terrible smile, I'll examine your body very carefully. 
You'll be the first man to be tested on my obstacle course, Mr. Bond, of the British Secret Intelligence Service. You're very lucky. Please, try to think about that as you die. The doctor finished speaking, turned away, and walked out of the room. Now all Bond's thoughts were about escaping. If he could escape from Dr. No's guards for a few minutes, he might be able to find the girl. And if he couldn't help Honey to escape, he might be able to kill her quickly. That would be better for her than the death which Dr. No had described. As Bond thought about this, the servant pulled him from his chair. Bond kept his arms tightly against his sides. Between his right arm and his body, he was now holding the sharp knife and the cigarette lighter. The Chinese man took Bond out of the room and pushed him into a lift. The lift travelled upwards for a few minutes and then stopped. When the doors opened, Bond was taken down a long corridor. At the end of the corridor, the two men stopped in front of an open door. The door had the letter Q marked on it. The Chinese servant pushed Bond through the doorway. Bond was now in a small room about fifteen feet long and fifteen feet wide. The walls were made of stone, and there was a wooden chair in the middle of the room. On the chair were Bond's jeans and his shirt. They had been washed and dried. "'Well, here you are, my friend,' the servant said. He smiled a horrible smile. He knew what was going to happen to Bond, and thinking about it pleased him. "'There's nothing to eat,' "'And there's nothing to drink in here,' the guard went on. "'There won't ever be anything to eat or drink. "'You can sit on the chair and wait to die, "'or you can find your way out to the obstacle course. "'Good luck.' "'A moment later, the man left the room and locked the door behind him. "'Chapter 14 the obstacle course. Bond looked more carefully around the little stone room. The door was made of strong metal, and there was no handle on it. Above the door there was a small window made of very thick glass. He wasn't going to escape that way. But high up on one wall in a corner there was a ventilation grill. The grill was made of thick wire, and Bond could feel cool air coming through it. The grill covered a circular opening, which was wider than Bond's shoulders. "'Well, that grill covers a ventilation shaft,' Bond said to himself. "'I guess that the shaft leads onto the obstacle course. I must hurry. Dr. No's men must have taken honey out onto the mountainside already.' Bond took off the kimono and quickly put on his own clothes. He looked at the cigarette lighter and the knife. Perhaps he could use these two things as weapons.' They might be useful during the ordeal that he was going to endure. But then he saw that the frame of the grill was made from one long piece of wire. If he could pull the grill away from the wall and straighten the wire frame, perhaps he could make a spear from it. Bond put the lighter in his pocket. Then, holding the knife in his teeth, he moved the chair. He put it against the wall just under the grill. He stood on the chair and grasped the metal grill with his right hand. There was a flash of blue light. Bond felt a terrible pain in his arm, and he was thrown backwards off the chair. His head hit the stone floor, and for a few moments he was unconscious. Bond woke up. There was a smell of burning skin in the air. Bond looked at his right hand. A red mark across his fingers showed where the grill had burned him. The grill had been electrified. And as he looked at the burn, he started to feel pain in his hand. Then he thought about Honey Rider. She was on the mountainside, waiting for the crabs to come. He had to get out of this room. Dr. No doesn't want me to die here, Bond told himself. That was just the beginning of my ordeal. That was the first physical obstacle. Pain. Has the doctor turned off the electricity now? I think that he'll let me go on. He wants me to endure different kinds of pain. Now this is one of his mental obstacles. Will I be able to touch the grill again, 
or am I too frightened of the electricity? He wants to know if I've lost my nerve. Well, I haven't. Bond cut a piece of cloth from the kimono and wrapped it around his injured hand. Then he climbed onto the chair again, and he grasped the grill with his left hand. There was no flash this time. He pulled the grill with all his strength. After a moment, the whole frame came away from the wall. He grasped the electric cable which was attached to the frame, and he tore it away. Then he started to pull the wire frame off the grill. Soon Bond had pulled the wire frame straight. He had made it into a simple spear about four feet long. At one end there was a sharp point. Bond bent a few inches of the wire to make a hook at the other end. Then he bent the spear in half, and he pushed it down inside one leg of his jeans. Now the hook was on the outside, over his belt. Bond put the knife between his teeth again. Then he jumped up onto the chair and pulled himself up through the circular opening in the wall. A moment later, Bond was inside the horizontal ventilation shaft. The shaft was about four inches wider than Bond's shoulders, and it was made of shiny, slippery metal. When he lit his cigarette lighter for a few moments, Bond saw that the shaft continued straight ahead. Lying flat on his stomach, Bond began to crawl forwards. The air in the shaft was cool. Soon, Bond knew, something else would happen to him. He would reach another obstacle. But his enemy didn't want him to die yet. Dr. No wanted to know how much pain Bond could endure. Bond was sure that there would be several more obstacles before the end of the course. Perhaps he would die at one of them, or perhaps he would reach the end of the course. But what then, Bond asked himself, if I'm still alive at the end of the course, Dr. No will try to kill me. So, is there any hope for me? Bond thought, as he crawled forward. Dr. No wants me to believe that there's no hope. That's another one of his mental obstacles. But he doesn't know about my three weapons. And he doesn't understand how strong my feelings are. I want to stay alive and kill him. After a few minutes, Bond reached the end of the horizontal shaft. Now there seemed to be a light shining above him. Bond turned over carefully, so that he was lying on his back. Above his head, there was another shaft of bright metal a vertical shaft. There was a light far away at the top of this shaft. Bond guessed that the shaft was about fifty yards high. Carefully, Bond stood up. Could he climb up this smooth vertical shaft? He thought that he could. He took off his shoes. Then he took a deep breath of air and pressed his shoulders against the sides of the shaft. While his elbows held his body still, he pulled his legs up a few inches. Then he pressed his feet against the sides of the shaft. His feet held him in his new position while he pulled in his shoulders and straightened his legs. This movement pushed his body a little higher up the shaft. The bare skin on his hands and feet stuck to the metal walls of the shaft. It stopped him slipping back down. Moving like this, about six inches each time, Bond slowly climbed up the shaft. It was painful and tiring. The muscles in Bond's stomach, arms and legs began to shake. When he was about halfway up, his feet began to slip on the shiny metal. He had slipped about a yard back down the shaft before he could stop himself. He realized what the problem was. He was getting hot, and his hands and feet were wet with sweat. So he closed his eyes and he stayed in the same place for ten minutes until he was cooler. Then, very carefully, he wiped each foot on the cloth of his trouser legs and started to climb again. It seemed a very long time before Bond reached the top of the shaft. When he did reach it, he noticed two things. First, he could feel cold air on the left side of his face. Then he saw that the light, which he had seen while he was climbing, came from a glass window. The window was the ceiling of the shaft. After a few moments, 
Bond realized that the cold air came from another horizontal shaft which joined the vertical one here. He would be able to pull himself into it. When he did that, he would be able to lie flat for a while and rest. His feet and arms and shoulders were terribly painful, but after a rest, he could continue on the obstacle course. Using the last of his strength, Bond pulled himself into the new shaft and turned onto his back. For a few minutes, he lay there, unable to move, and suddenly he fell asleep. Bond woke slowly. He didn't know how long he had been sleeping, but he knew that he felt a little stronger now. It was time for him to move on to the next obstacle. Before he turned onto his stomach, he looked up at the window in the ceiling. Someone was behind the glass, watching him. Bond said something very rude about Dr. No. The person couldn't hear what Bond said, but Bond hoped that the person saw the shapes of the words on Bond's lips and understood them. A moment later, Bond was crawling along the new shaft, like the first shaft, this one was dark. There were no lights or windows in it. After a few minutes, Bond realized that the metal walls of the shaft were getting hot. The further he went on, the hotter the metal became. And the air was no longer cool. It was hot. Bond came to a place where the shaft went around a corner. He lit his cigarette lighter and slowly put his head round the corner. What he saw made him pull his head back. The metal walls of the shaft ahead of him weren't shiny. They were dull and red with heat. So heat was to be the next ordeal. How could he crawl along this hot metal? He would be terribly burned. What shall I do, he thought. I could go back. I could go back to the room with the chair. If I go back... I know that I'll die there. But if I go on, perhaps I'll escape. Dr. No doesn't want me to die yet, Bond told himself. He's testing me again. He wants me to endure some more physical ordeals before I die. So this metal won't be too hot. The heat will injure me, but it won't kill me. He thought about the metal burning his skin. And then he thought about the beautiful girl. Honey was waiting on the mountainside for the crabs to attack her. He couldn't go back now. Bond took his knife from between his teeth and cut some pieces of cloth from the front of his shirt. He tied the cloth around his hands and feet. For a short time, the pieces of cloth would protect his hands and feet. His shirt would protect his shoulders, and the legs of his jeans would protect his knees for a short time, too. He put the knife in his mouth and crawled forward. He tried to keep his bare skin away from the hot metal. Bond moved as fast as he could, but soon the cloth around his hands and feet started to burn. The cloth on the knees of his jeans started to burn too. Only the sweat which was running down his arms and legs stopped the cloth from bursting into flames. Keep going, keep going, keep going, he told himself. The metal became hotter and hotter. With each movement the pain became worse. And each time that he moved, Bond screamed. He could smell his skin burning, but he knew that he had to go on until his skin was burned from his bones. Suddenly, his head hit something. It was a thin metal door, and as Bond's head touched it, the door moved aside. He crawled past it, and suddenly, everything changed. Here, the metal walls of the shaft were cool. Ice-cold air was blowing all around him. Bond fell forward, his eyes closed. He couldn't see or hear anything. He was unconscious. Chapter 15 The Last Ordeals When he woke again, Bond slowly turned over onto his back. He saw that there was another window in the ceiling of the shaft just above his head. He saw a face behind the glass. Another of Dr. No's men was studying him. The man wasn't interested in Bond's injuries. 
He was only interested in how much pain Bond could endure. He was only interested in how long Bond was going to live. For a moment, Bond was angry. Then, as he felt the pain from the burns on his knees and feet and hands move through his body, he made a noise like an animal. Bond turned over once again. Again, he began to move forward, slowly, along the shaft. At first, he moved without thinking. But after a while, there was a little less pain. Soon, he was able to think again. It was nearly an hour before Bond came to the next obstacle on Dr. No's course. Bond knew that the obstacle was there before he understood what it was. Ahead of him, Bond saw tiny, sparkling red lights. They were moving about, and when he stopped moving himself, he could hear a sound. It was a soft, tapping sound. As he crawled forward again, the tiny red lights came closer, and the tapping sound grew louder. What was waiting for him now? Bond lit his cigarette lighter, held it up, and found the answer to his question. Three feet in front of Bond, there was a metal grill. The grill was like a curtain made from very thin metal wires. Behind the grill, there were about twenty large, hairy spiders. This was a cage of giant tarantulas. The little red lights that Bond had seen in the dark were the spider's eyes. The tapping sound was made by their soft, hairy feet on the metal wires of the cage. Bond tried to remember everything he knew about tarantulas. These poisonous spiders were the largest in the world. Their bodies were about four inches long, and their legs were five inches long. Their bodies and their legs were covered in long hairs. Their teeth were sharp and full of poison. If one spider bit a man, he would be ill and in great pain for a while. He probably wouldn't die. But Bond had to crawl through this cage with twenty tarantulas in it. If more than one bit him, he probably would die. Bond looked at the spiders and remembered the centipede in his hotel room. Again, he felt cold with fear and disgust. But that was what Dr. No wanted. Bond knew that. If I think about these spiders on my body and in my hair, I won't be able to go on, he said to himself. If I think about them biting me, I won't be able to go on. But I must go on. I'm going to rescue Honey. Perhaps Dr. No thinks that this is the ordeal that'll kill me. But he doesn't know about my three weapons. Bond carefully took the spear from inside his trouser leg. He unbent the wire and pulled the spear to its full length. Then he turned a little wheel on his cigarette lighter, which made the flame bigger. Finally, he cut a large hole in the grill with his knife and crawled into the cage. The spider started to run towards him, but when they saw the flame from the lighter, they stopped. They were afraid of the fire. They didn't know what to do, and while the spiders were standing still, Bond began to stab his spear into their soft, hairy bodies. After he had killed several of them, the other spiders started to move forward again, but they wouldn't come near the flame from the lighter. They started to bite the dead and dying spiders that Bond had stabbed, and while they were doing this, Bond killed more of them. When at last all the spiders were dead, Bond pushed their bodies to one side of the cage. He quickly crawled towards the grill at the back of the cage, cut a hole in it with his knife, and climbed through. When Bond left the cage, he bent the spear in half again. Then he pushed it down inside one leg of his jeans. He put the lighter back in his pocket, and he put the knife between his teeth again. A light came on above his head. Bond looked up and saw what he expected to see. Another of Dr. No's watchers was looking at him. But this man moved his head slowly from side to side. Then he looked very, very sad. Finally, he held up his hand with a thumb pointing downwards. He's telling me that this is the end, Bond thought. He's saying, the next ordeal will kill you. 
there was nothing Bond could do. He had to move forward. Soon he realized that the shaft was sloping downwards, and he realized that the metal walls were more slippery than before. After a few minutes, the weight of his own body was moving him along. Bond didn't have to crawl anymore. He didn't have to move his arms and legs at all. For a while, this felt pleasant. He was able to rest and move at the same time. But then the slope became steeper, and Bond realized that he was moving faster and faster. He pressed his hands and feet against the sides of the shaft, but the metal tore his skin. He couldn't stop now, even if he wanted to. And then suddenly he could see bright sunshine ahead of him. As he got closer to the sunlight, he could smell the sea. In a moment, he came to the end of the shaft and fell out into the air beyond it. A hundred feet below him, Bond saw the blue-gray water of the Caribbean Sea. He had just enough time to remove the knife from his mouth and stretch his arms out in front of him before he entered the water. As he hit the water, Bond fell unconscious for a few moments. But by the time that his body had come up to the surface of the water, he was conscious again. He started to swim, and as he swam, he looked around him. Bond was swimming in a small inlet that had the shape of a triangle. It had three sides. On two sides of the inlet, there were tall cliffs of rock. But the third side of the inlet was a tall fence. The inlet was separated from the open sea by this fence, which was made of very thick, strong wire. The fence stood ten feet above the surface of the water, and as he swam up to the fence, Bond could see that it went down many feet beneath the surface, too. On the two sides of the inlet, which were cliffs, the water was against the very steep walls of rock. There were no beaches, and there were no paths up the cliffs. Bond was very tired, and his body was full of pain, but he knew that he had to climb the fence. The fence was like a huge metal net. There were lots of places where he could put his feet and hands when he started to climb. Bond pulled himself out of the water and up onto the fence. He stopped with his feet on a horizontal wire which was about three feet above the surface of the water. For a moment, he looked out to the sea through the holes in the fence. Then he turned round to look at the inlet behind him. He pushed his knife into the belt of his jeans. With both his hands, he grasped the vertical wires above his head. He looked down at the hundreds of small fish swimming in the water beneath him. I'm safe here for a while, Bond thought. I'll rest until I feel stronger. But then he asked himself these questions. Why is this inlet here? And why is this inlet separated from the open sea? Dr. No must have made this fence, but I don't believe that the last ordeal on this obstacle course is a wire fence. Climbing over it will be much too easy. Dr. No isn't interested in easy obstacles. Then Bond looked again at the inlet behind the fence. Perhaps this is the place where Dr. No wants me to die, he told himself. The inlet is like a big cage. Perhaps it is a cage. But what kind of animal does Dr. No keep in it? He soon had an answer to his question. First, all the small fish disappeared. They swam quickly away from the fence. Then, a moment later... The shape of an enormous grey creature appeared in the water, just beneath the place where Bond was standing. It was a giant squid. At first, the creature had been deep down in the water, but now it was coming nearer and nearer to the surface. Bond just had time to remember Quarrel's story about the giant octopus which had attacked his friend Pussfella near Crab Key. As he remembered the story, a huge tentacle came up out of the water. The tentacle was as broad as the top part of Bond's arm. It touched the fence below Bond's feet. So this is my final ordeal, Bond thought. He tried to climb a little higher on the fence, but he was weak and in pain. He climbed very slowly. He looked down again, and he saw two eyes looking up through the water at him. The eyes were as large as footballs. 
They looked calm and almost friendly. For a moment Bond thought that the squid wasn't interested in him, but then it moved its tentacle and touched one of Bond's legs. The tentacle moved over Bond's leg, then grasped it, pressing it hard. It's asking itself if I'm good to eat, Bond told himself. A moment later, the squid attacked. A second long tentacle came up out of the water and grabbed Bond's left arm. Bond pulled his knife from his jeans with his right hand. He stabbed and cut the tentacle with the knife. But now there were more tentacles moving up the wire fence. They held Bond's body, pulling him down towards the water, and they were terribly strong. Then the creature's enormous head appeared, and now Bond thought that its eyes looked angry. The squid's huge, sharp beak was opening and closing near Bond's feet. In a moment, the creature was going to start eating him. There was only one thing to do. Bond pulled the wire spear from his trouser leg and stabbed it deep into one of the terrible creature's eyes. He stabbed the eye again and again. The last time, he left the spear there. For a few seconds, the surface of the sea looked like water boiling in a cooking pan. Then suddenly the color of the water changed. The sea around Bond was no longer blue, it was black. When Bond had stabbed the squid, it had released ink from its body. Bond and the fence were covered in the stinking black liquid. Suddenly Bond felt the squid's tentacles falling away from his body. In a moment the creature had swum away and the water became calm again. After the giant squid had gone, Bond rested on the fence for a while. Then he slowly climbed over the top of the fence and dropped down into the sea on the other side. He swam towards the shore of the rocky headland on the south side of the fence. Soon he could see a path in the rocks of the headland. He thought that the path must lead up to Dr. No's headquarters. All night... There had been two thoughts in Bond's mind. He wanted to live long enough to kill Dr. No, and he wanted to save honey from the black crabs. But it was many hours now since Bond had started his ordeal. It had been late evening when Dr. No's servant had locked him in the stone room with the ventilation grill, and now it was morning. The girl must be dead. The only thing to do now was to find Dr. No. I still have the knife, Bond told himself. As Bond pulled himself out of the sea, he had a surprise. He heard a loud sound. It was the sound of a ship's siren. It was coming from somewhere close to where Bond was standing. The path in front of him led along the bottom of the cliff and went around the end of the headland. There must be a key on the other side of this headland, Bond thought. It must be the place where guano is loaded into the ships. As he walked towards the end of the headland, Bond heard another sound, but he couldn't guess what was making this noise. It sounded like lots of pieces of metal crashing together. At the end of the headland there was a large rock. Bond stopped behind it. He would have to look very carefully round this rock before he went any further. There might be guards with guns on the other side. Bond moved very slowly and looked carefully round the corner. For ten seconds he looked at what was beyond it, then he moved back and hid behind the rock again. Chapter 16 Licensed to Kill Bond hid behind the large rock. He thought about everything that he'd seen during those ten seconds when he'd looked beyond the rock. He tried to make a picture in his mind. In front of him and below him, Bond had seen a key which was built out into the sea. The key was about twenty yards long and had the shape of a letter T. A large old ship was tied beside the T of the key. Bond hadn't seen any men on the deck of the ship. He guessed that they were in the cabins below the deck. The ship was being loaded with guano by two machines a long conveyor, and a crane. It was these machines which were making the strange noise that Bond had heard. The conveyor stood on tall metal legs. 
It was built down the side of the mountain to the quay. Its belt was covered by a metal roof. Guano was carried from the mountain to the ship waiting at the quay along this belt. The end of the conveyor, which was nearest the quay, did not stand on metal legs. It moved from one side to another. It was like an arm. At the end of the conveyor's arm, there was a huge sleeve of strong cloth. The crane stood on the quay beside the ship. The crane also had a long arm made of metal. As the guano traveled along the conveyor, the crane's arm moved the arm and sleeve of the conveyor. The crane moved the sleeve of the conveyor above some openings in the deck of the ship. The crane moved the sleeve to each of these openings until the ship was completely loaded with guano. The arm and sleeve of the conveyor was controlled by one man, the driver who sat in the control cabin of the crane. There was a steering wheel and levers and buttons in front of the driver. He turned the wheel and pulled and pressed the levers to control the long arm at the front of the crane. And the cabin of the crane was just on the other side of the big rock, only ten yards from where Bond was standing now. Bond thought about all this. And he thought about two other things that he'd seen. The first thing was the position of the crane's arm. It was controlled by the steering wheel in the cabin. If this wheel was turned as far as possible to the right, the sleeve of the conveyor wouldn't be above the ship. It would be above the key. The other thing was this. Standing on the key, watching the loading of the guano, was a tall, thin man. Dr. Julius No. If someone turned the crane steering wheel as far as possible to the right, the sleeve of the conveyor would stop above his head. Yes, I must do it, Bond told himself. But first, I'll have to get rid of the crane driver. Bond was Agent 007. He was licensed to kill. He knew that he had to kill Dr. No. The madman was dangerous and cruel. He enjoyed torturing people. Slowly and carefully, Bond looked around the rock again. As he did this, the crane driver turned his head. Bond recognized him immediately. It was the big man who had driven the dragon. It was the man who had killed Quarrel. Quarrel had died in a terrible way, so now Bond wanted to kill this man very much. Bond waited till the crane driver was looking at the ship again. Then he moved fast. He pulled his knife from his belt, ran to the crane's cabin, and pulled open the door. Before the tall Afro-Chinese man could turn around, Bond had grabbed his hair. Then Bond pulled back the man's head and stabbed the knife deep into his neck. As the driver fell dead onto the floor of the cabin, Bond grabbed the steering wheel. He turned it towards the right as fast as he could. The arm of the crane started to move the arm and sleeve of the conveyor away from the ship. Down on the quay, Dr. No didn't realize what was happening at first. He'd stopped looking at the guano falling from the sleeve and into the ship. He was looking out across the sea. But when the guano started to fall on him, he looked up quickly and started to shout. Then he turned and looked at the crane's cabin. He saw Bond at the controls, and at that moment, Dr. No understood what was happening. He tried to scream, and he tried to run, but it was too late. The guano poured from the sleeve of the conveyor like a river. The stinking dust fell into Dr. No's eyes and mouth. The river of guano knocked him to the ground and covered his head and body. In a few seconds, only his arms could be seen waving in the air. Two minutes later, Dr. Julius No was under a pile of guano which was twenty feet high. He was dead, and Bond was happy about it. Dr. No would never torture another person, and the Russians wouldn't get their information about Turk's Island. Bond switched off the conveyor's engine. He took the gun from the dead man who was lying at his feet. It was a Smith & Wesson .38. A good gun. Then he ran from the quay. He had to find honey. Bond climbed up the rocks and ran into a tunnel. 
As he ran, Bond heard the ship's siren. Somebody had realized what had happened at the quay. Somebody was warning Dr. No's men. Bond was tired. There was pain in every part of his body. His strength was nearly gone, but he kept running. The tunnel had only a few lights in the ceiling, and it smelled of guano. Bond couldn't see clearly, and he couldn't breathe easily. Suddenly, someone was on the path in front of him. The person started hitting him and biting him. Bond had just enough strength to lift his attacker off the ground. Then he saw that it was a girl with long, pale, blonde hair. "'Honey, stop! This is James,' he said. There was silence for a few moments. Then the girl started to cry, and Bond held her tightly in his arms. "'Oh, James, my darling,' she cried. "'I thought that you were dead. I thought that Dr. No had killed you. I love you, James. Please don't leave me again.' "'I thought that you were dead, too,' Bond replied. "'I thought that the crabs had eaten you. "'Oh, that stupid man doesn't know anything about the animals who live on these islands,' Honey said." I was never worried about the crabs. I know all about them. They eat plants. They don't eat meat. And they don't usually attack people. Perhaps if someone had an injury with lots of blood, the crabs might bite a person. Perhaps that happened to the other girl the Dr. No told us about. But I didn't have any injuries. The crabs just walked over me and went on up the mountain." "'But you fainted when Dr. No told you about the crabs,' Bond said. "'When that happened, I believed what he'd said about them.' "'I was afraid for you, James,' Honey replied. "'That's why I fainted, my darling. "'I thought that he was going to torture you terribly. "'Was it terrible?' "'Yes, it was terrible,' Bond said. "'But it's all finished now. "'Dr. No is dead.' Now we must escape from this island before his men kill us. We've got to get to the beach as fast as we can. We've got to find the canoe. After all their ordeals, Bond and Honey reached the beach easily. They stole the dragon. Dr. No's men had hunted Bond and Honey for a while. They had followed the fugitives out of the tunnel. They had brought dogs to follow the fugitives' tracks. But then Bond shot five of Dr. No's men and the hunters let Bond and the girl escape. Bond and Honey found the dragon and drove it towards the lake, and after driving through the mangroves for an hour, they reached the beach and found the canoe. With the last of his strength, Bond pulled the little boat from its hiding place and pushed it into the water. Then he fell into the canoe and lay there, unable to move. It was Honey who sailed the canoe back to Morgan's Harbour. For most of the journey, Bond lay in the bottom of the little boat, resting and sleeping. But when they were near to the Jamaican coast, the girl woke him. Bond sat up slowly and looked at the sea. He was thinking about the future and about the past. When they landed, he would take the girl to Bow Desert. He would leave her there for a day or two, while she rested there, he would be in Kingston. He'd go to King's house, and he'd send a message to M in London. And then he'd tell the acting governor everything that he knew about Crab Key and about the work that Dr. Julius No had been doing for the Soviet Union. He'd also tell him that Strangways and True Blood had been murdered. Bond thought about everything that had happened since his arrival in Jamaica. He thought sadly about his friend Quarrel. Soon he would have to talk to Quarrel's family. Bond would tell them about Dr. No and about Crab Key. He'd tell them that Quarrel had been a good man and a good friend. He'd tell them about the money that they would soon have from Quarrel's life insurance. But he wouldn't tell them exactly how his friend had died. Bond thought about Honey, too. She was clever. She could study sea animals at a university. He'd ask Bladel Smith to arrange that. And he'd ask the colonial secretary and his wife to look after Honey for the next few years. He couldn't do more for her than that. Soon there would be another mission for Bond. Soon he'd have to return to London. But before he had to leave, he would spend some time alone with Honey. 
they wouldn't have much time together. He hoped that the girl would understand that. She'd said that she loved him, but the life of an SIS agent was a lonely and difficult one. There wasn't much time in an agent's life for love. James Bond was very thoughtful as he watched the coast of Jamaica get nearer and nearer.